Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. That if, if you don't like what's going on in your world, in your life, this too shall pass. And the bitterness of that is if you love what's happening in your life right now, this too shall pass. We were talking this week, we, I have been on Zoom a lot. <laughs> I'm so tired of looking at my own face. But um, something that we had said, David, kind of struck you that um, we think our security lies in form, that we think that it's this job, this paycheck, the ability to buy toilet paper at the store, those kind of forms we rely on for our security. And when they're not there, what, where are we? What do we do? And the call from that song and this series that we're doing this month on evolution and change is that our security does not lie in outward form. Our security does not lie anywhere in the world. It lies in our spiritual connection to God, to life itself. And when we get scared of the change, when we hold too tightly, we grasp too much, we don't trust that life will continue to show us beauty and blessing if we can let this go and just let it be. I wasn't going to say any of that, but you inspired me, Tony. So what I, I want to start to begin with by just um, a huge thank you to all of the people who are keeping us safe right now, particularly, um, can we just have some appreciation for all of our medical professionals who are working so hard to... Um, to keep us safe, and even the people working in those grocery stores, safe from, yes, from there being, you know, people are coming in potentially, um, you know, uh, opening them up to the virus, but also from people fighting over the toilet paper. I mean, they're having to do a lot of, of managing, and so we want to give thanks to all those people who are still out there providing what we need so that we can continue to live our lives, our, our, all of our public safety people, our leaders, so I just feel so grateful. This is very different. It's a very different time. Um, two and a half years ago, we experienced a Category 4 hurricane. It was the largest rainfall ever recorded in North American history from a single storm. Happened right here. It was incredible. So the flooding that occurred, about 100 families in our church. My own Cindy Klein right there. I was in her devastated home helping her pull out drywall. It was just so many of our, two, yeah, Reverend Mindy also on our staff had two homes flooded. It was devastating. And the thing that happened at that point was that we could get out and help people. You know, we saw all these beautiful images in that disaster of, of people getting people out of their homes. And then once the waters receded of, of helping people get their homes back in order and remove all that stuff, it was so we had something we could do. <laughs> and this one feels so different because we're being told to do nothing. <laughs> stay home. Stay out of the streets. Stay out of the, the stores. I'm here in Houston. All the restaurants are closed except for takeout. So what can we do? How, it doesn't feel good to stay at home. But that is what we're being asked to do. So I was, um, we had a, we've been having more meetings through Zoom with, with our staff. And we normally just have one big staff meeting on Tuesday morning where we all connect. But now we're doing three of those a week so we can continue to just stay connected and see what's going on for people. And this week, our controller, Dion, she asked our staff to answer this question. What am I learning about myself during this time of, of physical distancing? And I asked their permission, and two of our staff members had something really insightful and kind of humorous to share. Reverend Shirley Knight, she said, what I have learned about myself is that I love being home until I'm told I have to be. <laughs> <laughs> and our bookstore manager and the director of our Unity Women program, Donna Fisher, she said, what I've learned about myself is that those things that I thought I was going to do but I was just too busy, that's not why I'm not doing them. <laughs> <laughs> So some of you can relate to that. I, I do want to share with you that there was a, a, 
Um, and I'm sorry, Chris, you're going to have to follow me all around with that camera today because you know how I am. <laughs> this was a critical advisory that you need to know that 8 p.m. is now the official time to remove, move, to remove your day pajamas and to put on your night pajamas. So you've got that. <laughs> 8 o'clock is the time that we do that. <sighs> so let's just breathe together. We're going to get through this. We really are. And even as uncomfortable as it feels to be at home doing nothing, and a lot of us are working long hours just in our day pajamas, but we are, we're doing what needs to be done, but it just feels uncomfortable and different. We don't have the same freedom that we had to do what we would normally do. I just encourage you to be okay with where we are and just know that we're going to get through it. There's a poem that I want to share with you by Lynn Unger. It's called Pandemic. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath the most sacred of times? Cease from travel. Cease from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing. Pray. Touch only those to whom, to whom you would commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. Do not reach out your hands. Reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love for better and for worse, in sickness and in health, as long as we all shall live. So this time of slowing down and aloneness, as I said, most people are still working from home. I know some have been deeply affected economically by some businesses being closed right now, and so we also want to pray for them and pray for our leaders that they know the right ways to get us through this time. But I want to set all that aside for a moment and point us to something. This, this is our, our five-week series we're doing on change and evolution. I said last week I think I over-manifested. We're, we we're experiencing more change than I thought we were going to in the month of March in, in the the world. Um, but today I had chosen weeks and weeks ago before the pandemic, I chose the title, The Path of Personal Transformation. And I really thought, do I want to change that given what's changed in the world? And I thought this week, no, this is right. That as we are all being called inward physically, this is a perfect time to examine our own lives and our own path of healing and of growth and of remembering who we are. And are we showing up in our world, in our lives, in our work, as the best of who we authentically are? See, transformation is, um, hmm, it's different than change. Change happens, you can change back. Transformation means at the deepest level, it has become something new. And it's a little bit of a paradox here because when I'm speaking of personal spiritual transformation, that's true. We are leaving behind the forms that we identified with who we thought we were so that we can step into something new, which is what we already are. That's what I'm really talking about. There's a saying I learned in AA that said, wherever you go, there you are. Do you know that? Wherever you go, there you are. You can't run from your own life. You can't run from your destiny. You can't really run from your family because they still live back here. I don't know if you knew that. And all of your life is a conspiracy for your good, is an invitation for you to, as Rumi said, discover and deliver the authentic self. And so some of you are coming up against your own addictions and compulsive behavior when you have all this time on your hands without the things that you normally do for distraction. You're looking for new ones. And I invite you to notice that, not judge yourself, not be critical, but notice and try just sitting, just not acting out, not avoiding your own self for just little bits of time. Pick up a notebook and 
you know, the, what's the Julia Cameron morning pages idea? Just write with your own hand, not on a computer or on your phone, three pages. Just whatever comes out. That's a way of beginning to meet yourself. Because where you are, there you are. And all that you need for the discovery and delivery of your authentic self, of your authentic vocation, of your purpose and meaning, it's already there. There's an old Zen story. I love the Zen Buddhist path. They, have, they teach so much in these beautiful stories, and some of them are meant to be paradoxical. They're not really meant to be understood by the linear mind. They're meant to, dive us, uh, to drive us into a deeper question. And we in the West don't like the questions. We like the answers. But there's something about that path that just makes us question our assumptions and our perspectives and think of it differently. Well, this is one of those stories, although I'm going to tell you what it means, so just hang with me, that a, a pilgrim was seeking a great and revered teacher so that he could become enlightened. And he had heard and he had asked for many years on where this teacher was and how he could find him. And he was in a very remote region of the world, and so he got his faithful horse, and he began to travel and travel across rivers and mountains, searching for this teacher, always asking, where is the teacher who can lead me to enlightenment? One day, after many, many months, he came to the mouth of a cave, and he saw the old monk there in robes standing, and he knew intuitively this is the teacher he had sought all of that time. Through all of the difficulty and the pain, he was at the moment. And the teacher turned to him with such a beautiful smile, extended his hand and says, what is it you seek? And the pilgrim said with his heart breaking open, he said, I seek enlightenment. And the teacher said, it might be better if you were to seek a horse. And he said, what are you talking about? I already have a horse. And the monk smiled and bowed and went in the cave. <laughs> that which you're seeking, you already possess. You may think that you're seeking professional achievement and fame and wealth, and that's really not what you're seeking. You see, I don't think that we're, we're really wired to seek the pursuit of happiness that we say here in America. I don't really think that's the actual ground uh, that we want to build our lives upon. What I think we're really looking for is meaning and fulfillment. And fulfillment comes when we, as Rumi says, we discover and deliver who we are fully into the world. And so our pain, our struggle, our strife, our suffering is not caused by anything happening out there in the world. It's because, because we don't know who we are. That we think we're seeking the teacher in the cave and we've got our trusty horse right here with us. What we need is already given. We are here to face ourselves, to see what we see fully with a clear eye, I was speaking uh, to a friend of mine, wonderful Maggie Cole. She spoke here on this stage uh, about a year ago. It was right about a year ago she was here. And um, wonderful teacher of new thought and practitioner of science of mind. Incredible, incredible soul. One of my best friends in the world. And uh, she turns 80 this year. My mom turned 80 yesterday. I, didn't, I was, was not able to be with her, but I got to talk to her and wish her a Gosh, a completion of eight full decades on this planet. My mother said it was the best day she's ever had. In the middle of a global pandemic, she felt the love and the support of all those around her. But back to Maggie. I was telling Maggie about all these meetings that I've been on in Zoom. And, you know, I'll be 54 in a couple of months, which is not 80. But um, my skin doesn't hang in the same way it did at 30. And I have this little thing right here that when I'm looking down at Zoom, I can just see it moving. And it's like, when did that start? And, you know, early in the mornings, I have, like, these coin purses under my eyes. Like, what happened there? And so all week long, I'm looking at myself as I'm looking at everybody else. Because if you haven't been on video conferencing, you get to see yourself while you're seeing everybody else all week long. It's like, does it really look like? You guys have been seeing it all this long. You haven't told me. You didn't tell me because that's not how I look like in my mind. 
And I'm not troubled by it. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday that I, I, it was kind of cold here, and I put on a button-down shirt and a V-neck sweater, and I went to get my watch, and I looked in the bathroom mirror, and my dad was in the reflection. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. My dad had wrinkles and had this little thing, and he was a handsome, beautiful man. I love my dad. So I think I'm okay with the aging thing, but boy, it's right here. <laughs> well, anyway, Maggie was working with a, a teacher, a coach, and, and was also kind of doing some of that, how does this work, you know, seeing my changing face in the mirror. And what her teacher told her was, you can only look in the mirror if you look until you see something you love. You can only look in the mirror until you look until you find the thing. Maggie said one day she sat there, stood there at the mirror until she saw the light and the joy in her eyes. And she could love that. You see, our pain is in the forgetting of that, of our essence. Our essence knows nothing of our changing bodies. Our essence is always alive with possibility and joy, love and peace. Because our essence comes from God. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I read it a couple weeks ago at the beginning of this series, but it, it is one of my favorite mystical passages of the Apostle Paul. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory which comes from God, who is the Spirit. What are we being transformed into? The image and the likeness of the Most High. How were we created? In the image and in the likeness of the Most High. Who you are is always enough. At, at core, at essence, who you are is always perfect. Exactly what God had in mind. And all of our struggle, all of our suffering, all of our self-judgment and criticism is because we forget. We forget that who I am cannot be harmed, cannot be wrong, cannot be anything other than in the right place at the right time, experiencing, experiencing and expressing. It is the, the receiving and the giving of God's richest blessings of life. That's what we're here for. That's what our whole movement called Unity was founded upon, the whole New Thought movement. It was like, if we can get in touch with that truth, we can transform all of the details of our life. We can live that abundant life that Jesus said. We can, we can have relationships that meet us and feed us, that we get to support as we are supported. We can have a life of financial ease and freedom. We can have a life where our physical bodies give us what we need to do what we're here to do. There's that great quote from Charles Fillmore when he was 94 years old. He says, I arise, and I, I'm not going to get it exactly right. I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm as I rise up to do that which ought to be done by me at 94 years old. Did I get it right, Karen? I got it right. My little grade-A student in there is always trying to get it right. <sighs> Michael Beckwith says that we should stop trying to fix ourselves, start trying to see ourselves. You see, all of, gosh, the, the amount of judgment heaviness we place upon these beautiful lives we've been given, all of the ways that we see ourselves as being not enough, lacking, insufficient, it's just so sad. It's not necessary. It's just not necessary. So today, as I'm bringing this home, this idea of the path of personal transformation as we navigate the changes of life that we find ourselves in, I just invite you to give yourself compassion. You feel like you don't know how to do your life? Well, you've never been here before. Nobody prepared you for this. You weren't meant to have all the answers. You're not meant to have it all together in the way that we see it on Instagram where it's filtered and Pose. I love, have you seen the, all the Instagram influencers? They're showing behind the scenes of how they take those photos. It looks like they just walk out the door and go, ha. Ah. 
and they have lights, and they have people, and they have people holding their clothes. It's just, it's not what it looks like. That everybody has something, like my little thing, everybody has something. And these carefully curated, manicured images of perfection, if you, make, if you need that for your happiness, you're setting yourself up for failure and disappointment. But that's not who you are, remember? That's not who you are. Your true beauty comes from simply knowing who you are and living from that with such grace and generosity. I want to be a really cool old dude (laughs) who just is comfortable in all his skin with all of its sagging and wrinkles, who can just be and live and love and forgive, have you noticed how much forgiveness life takes? Have you noticed how much forgiveness every day we have opportunities? You are invited to remember the truth of your being. And when you forget, that's the beauty of relationship, of community. That's why we have this place here in Texas called Unity of Houston. We are here to help each other remember who we are when we forget. So I don't know who it is you need to reach out to today, but I I don't know if you know, but these things, you can actually talk in them. Did you know that? You can. You can pick them up and, and push somebody's, and you can talk and have a conversation. I encourage you today to reach out to someone and have a conversation. Let them know how perfect they are. And I have a feeling that there's somebody who would love to have a conversation with you and help you remember how perfect you are. When I forget, will you remember for me? When I forget, Will you remember for me? Help me see what you see when I forget. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.